Welcome to this pre-countdown status briefing for STS-133, Discovery's mission to the International Space Station. Um, we have two briefers here today to give us the latest on Discovery's preps for its uh, upcoming launch. First off, we have Jeff Spaulding, NASA Test Director. Good morning. And Kathy Winters, the Shuttle Weather Officer. Good morning. We'll start off with the latest and uh, I guess make a little bit of news here and then uh, open it up to questions. All right, and thank you, Allard, and good morning to everyone. And uh, Normally, I would be here just providing our normal launch countdown status to you and, and updating you on the uh, events uh, leading up to the countdown and some of the major milestones. But uh, last night, when we were doing uh, our uh, flight tank, our tank press to uh, flight mode, uh, we did have a couple of leaks that occurred, and uh, and we tried to uh, repair those overnight, and uh, we weren't completely successful in doing so, which is going to cause a little bit more work today. As a result of that, we're going to need to uh, delay the start of our launch countdown a day to in order to accomplish the repairs required for those leaks that we had. And uh, that would also move our launch date out one additional day to the, uh, the 2nd of November from the 1st. So I'll talk a little bit about um, the issues that we have right now. Um, as I mentioned, while we were doing our uh, pressurization last night, our right hand um, orbital maneuvering system helium tank, it vented down unexpectedly when we were venting the ground side. Uh, normally that doesn't happen. Those are generally um, isolated from each other which indicated we had uh, an issue with our air half or flight side coupling on uh, the t the between those two um, uh, quick disconnects that fit together that allow the, the um, uh, gases to flow back and forth. Um, so we did uh, tr attempt, as I mentioned, to uh, do some troubleshooting and repairs on that that were unsuccessful. Um, we did, uh, when we took the uh, air half coupling or the flight side off, we did notice there was part of a, a seal or an O-ring in there that looked like it came from the ground half side. We did remove that, attempt to remate the, the, the disconnects and, and the couplings, and um, we still were unsuccessful with uh, the repairs. So our forward plan at this point is to change out both the flight side and the ground side of those couplings, and we're going to work on that throughout the day. We've already been putting plans in place this morning to do that. Um, we do, as a result of that, when we did our pressurization last night to the flight mass on the, uh, the orbiter maneuvering system, we're going to have to vent those tanks back down again in order to do the, those repairs and the removal and replacement of those couplings. And then as we go back in throughout the day, then we'll, uh, we'll have to do uh, some additional uh, leak checks and, and uh, make sure that those things are ready to fly again before we hook them back up together and pressurize to uh, our flight mass again. Um, the big part of that whole process is the actual the repressurization of those tanks, which is about two shifts or nearly 16 hours of work. Um, the actual repairs and uh, removal and replacement of those parts isn't very complicated, and, we, and we've done it in the past. Um, these types of uh, couplings are we, we have had issues with different ones in the past, and, and so it's, it's fairly common when we have to go off and do these, and it's a well-known process, and the, and the folks do a really good job at that. But that's kind of the thing that's driving us, is the, the, the need to depressurize our, our tanks and then repressurize those. That repressurization of the tanks requires a pad clear, which precludes us from doing the normal things that we would do during a launch countdown. So as that goes throughout the day, we would not be able to pick up the launch countdown this afternoon if we had our pad clear doing the rest of those operations um, during the repressurization of those tanks. So that's why we made the decision to push off um, 24 hours for the start of the countdown and subsequently the, the launch date as well. Um, we do have a couple of other smaller items. There was another um, uh, issue with a, on our uh, nitrogen side. It was a, a ground side tank fill, uh, another one of those couplings that we're going to take the opportunity to fix when we get into the, the countdown as well. But that does not require any of the clears or the different things. It's a, it's a minor um, issue, and we we'll can do that in parallel with the rest of our work. So as a result of those changes, that moves our launch countdown uh, call to stations um, over a day, and we'll begin now at uh, 1.30 on Saturday, and then that'll move our uh, launch time out until uh, <laughs> Tuesday the 2nd at uh, 4.12 for the beginning of the window and 4.17 for the middle of the window, which we normally look, shoot for. Um, some of the major events, our earliest tanking then would be at 6.52 on Tuesday morning um, as we work towards getting into that uh, operation. Um, we do have our flight day three and flight day three and four capabilities throughout our launch window. I think we maybe have talked that in the past. Um, as it turns out, Tuesday is uh, simply a flight day three rendezvous only, which makes our window about 10 minutes or so. So it'll be kind of a normal opportunity. Every other day after that, we have some flight day four capability, which essentially just adds a couple of minutes to the window and uh, changes when we rendezvous with the station. Uh, we have plenty of pad hold time this time. 
we have eight days of liquid hydrogen, seven of liquid oxygen, which is good because our, our window of opportunity to get off the ground um, is up through and including the 7th of November. So that would give us uh, six days of attempts uh, to get off the ground between the 2nd and the 7th. Um, so the, uh, we will not re be required to do any top-offs during that time frame if, we, if, in fact, we needed to use more days in going downstream. Uh, the mission's 11 days, as I think you all are aware of, with uh, one contingency and two weather days. And the mission would, would bump a day over to Saturday the 13th um, at about 11 o'clock in the morning just after that. We do expect lots of, lots of crowds and lots of interest in this launch. We had a lot of visitors coming to KSC, a lot of visitors coming to the local area. We have an air show over the weekend as well. We expect some folks to stay over from that to, to watch the launch. So we do expect a lot of folks in the county. And as um, many of you are aware, that's also election day on the 2nd. So there will be a lot of people out and about on that day. We've, uh, I think we've done a lot to encourage uh, the folks that work at the Space Center to take the opportunity to do early voting and, and those types of things and, and make people aware of all those things to encourage them uh, because it would be a challenge with all the, uh, the folks around the, uh, the area to be able to get out on a launch day and, and get out and get that voting done. So I think folks have done a pretty good job taking advantage of that as much as possible. So. Um, I think we're really happy that we have the, the folks and the teams that are here to be able to, to handle these types of things. Um, these types of challenges are not uncommon for the team to step up and, and do what needs to be done. We're going to fly this vehicle when it's ready to go and, uh, and we'll take a look at it later today and, and make adjustments as required as far as the, the, the work we've got to do. But I think we'll be able to get that done and we're looking at uh, getting a call stations tomorrow. That's it. Thanks. Kathy. Well, the weather is uh, looking uh, very windy today, and then it improves for the, the weekend for the air show and also uh, as we get into Monday. And then as we get to Tuesday, we start getting concerned about some moisture that's going to be coming back up from the south as a, as a strong trough dips into the Texas area in, in the upper levels. We think that trough's going to get cut off in that area. So the moisture will feed up from the south, but we're not expecting that front to come into the area mid-next week. Now, some of the models the last few days were actually toggling back and forth on that, but typically they do that with cutoff lows and we, we typically see that a lot of times the lows just end up uh, sitting in place over uh, over the area so what we're expecting is that they'll sit in place that low will sit in place over the Texas area so with the moisture we mainly are concerned about low cloud ceilings and a chance for some isolated showers in the area of the shuttle landing facility for for the return to launch site abort so constraints and so with that we have a 30 percent chance of KSC weather prohibiting launch on Tuesday We'll go ahead and get into our satellite picture. Um, one thing to note is we do have a tropical storm Sherry that's out in the Atlantic, pretty much straight off to our east. Um, that's not going to be an issue for us as the trough comes down and pushes that off to the northeast. One area we are watching is a wave that is down off of uh, off of uh, southeast of the Lesser Antilles. That tropical wave is uh, has a 60% chance of becoming a tropical cyclone, according to the Hurricane Center, right now within the next 48 hours. So with that, we'll be watching that. It should track northwest into the Caribbean over the next four to five days, and that's something we'll just keep watching as we get towards launch day. It's likely not going to be an issue for launch day in this area, but one thing I always like to keep an eye on is for the SRB recovery ships as they're recovering the following two days after launch. Um, again, though, right now, a lot of uncertainty with that, and a lot will depend on what happens with that on, on where that upper level low uh, ends up um, being in about five to six days from now. So really won't be in our area around launch time, uh, but we're looking for it on launch day to be somewhere south of maybe eastern Cuba or in the Hispaniola area on launch day. Going into our, uh, let's go ahead and get into some of our uh, forecasts for our tanking forecast. We're expecting good weather overall, just some scattered skies. And there's a slight chance for a shower whenever we get those uh, onshore gradient winds, but um, this morning we're expecting just light and variable winds. Um, at a, and it's mainly going to be on the southeast once we start getting into the afternoon hours. But for this time period, light winds and no concerns for tanking. As we get into our launch forecast, we expect the winds to pick up from the southeast, 10 peaking to 15 knots. We do have a chance for a ceiling to occur. We have a scatter deck there at 3,000 feet. There is a chance it could become broken. That's just one of our concerns and also a chance for a shower in the area. So with that, we have a 30% chance of KSC weather prohibiting launch. If we do, uh, oh, excuse me, for the SRB recovery weather, it looks really uh, pretty good out there. It just sees three to four feet, winds from the southeast, again, 10 to 15 knots. No concerns for SRB recovery during the launch day. We do happen to, uh, oh, I keep wanting to go into delay, but we also want to talk about our CONUS abort sites. We do have good weather expected there, and for our TAL sites, two of our TAL sites are good. Um, let's 
going into the tau site weather on the next slide. Two of our tau sites are good, Zaragoza and Marone. There's a concern for a headwind at Istris, uh, peaking up to 30 knots there. If we do happen to delay 24 hours, um, we do expect more moisture in the area, a mid-level ceiling to come in, and also some high clouds as well. Again, we're, we are concerned there is a chance that scatter deck at 3,000 feet could go broken and become a ceiling. If that happens to occur, that would be a violation. Also, we do expect uh, that there could be a chance for some isolated showers in the area. But uh, we didn't want to overstate this too much because that low is so far off to the west. Um, and so uh, with that, we have a 30% chance of KSC weather prohibiting launch. For the CONUS sites on day two, everything looks good. And uh, for our TAL sites, the weather actually improves at Istra, so we have three good TAL sites if we happen to delay 24 hours. And if we happen to delay 48 hours, um, again, we have similar weather conditions for those three days uh, with, uh, again, a, a ceiling of 25,000 feet. There is a chance that that scatter deck, again, at 3,000 feet could go broken, so we'll be watching that each day. Winds do shift around more from the north on this day, uh, 12 peaking to 18 knots, a little bit stronger, but no violations there with the wind. And again, there could be an isolated shower in the area. We just have a chance for that. But overall, still just a 30% chance of KSC weather prohibiting launch. The uh, abort landing sites in the U.S. look good on day three. And the towel sites also look good with uh, good weather overall out in that area. So overall, we're mainly just going to be watching for that moisture coming up from the south, um, looking for just a chance for a ceiling or a shower in the area, but overall a 30% chance of KSC weather prohibiting launch. Okay, we'll open it up to questions now. Uh, please state your name, news affiliation, and uh, please wait for the microphone to come around. Start off with Marsha. Press with two questions for Jeff. Um, any relation whatsoever with the previous um, fuel leak or any of the repairs that may have been going on attached to that. And secondly, um, well, you can answer that first, and then I'll take it. Um, no, this is completely different um, than any of the other stuff that we've had to um, work on this particular ohms pod. Uh, the, mm -hmm. the fuel leak that you would refer to earlier was a seal on a crossfeed flange, which is in a completely different location than this. These are fairly common as, le as far as uh, the, when we have issues with these QDs, and they're, they're not significant as far as the ability to repair them. And so we've done that in the past plenty of times. And how sure are you that it is the couplings? I mean, could it be um, something else that might even take longer to repair? Well, we believe just based on the, uh, what we saw um, on it, the coupling itself with the seal, well, actually some seal material that, that shouldn't have been there, we believe that um, because of that um, and the, the, the leak that it had, all of the other areas on the, the pod itself um, did not have any leaks. We were able to isolate the, the areas and those types of things. So we feel pr pretty confident from, the, from that perspective that the rest of the, the vehicle is in very good shape and that these are some isolated things that we just need to repair. Uh, uh, James Dean from Florida today. I, I, forgive me. I just want to make sure I'm understanding kind of where the where the leak issues are. Is is it at the attachment between uh, the lines you're using to load the the gas and and the vehicle? Is that on the pod itself? There's there's an area in which there are uh, different um, couplings where we can hook up lines to them that have either uh, gas lines or fluid lines that connect to those areas. And this is under a normal servicing panel that's there. Um, one of those lines that is a helium line that we use to pressurize these tanks to flight mass is in between that connection and the vehicle is where we had to leak. And we, s we found some material there that says that it, there may be some contamination in that poppet on the flight side. Even though we were able to get it to seat to some extent, we're still concerned that it may not seat you know, throughout the flight. So we want to make sure that we have a good understanding of that and change it out as well as the ground side when we reconnect and go ahead and pressurize those tanks. And you were, you were talking about the fuel leak. Also, this this pod was was removed during the flow to replace a, a helium valve. That's mm -hmm. also unrelated. Just Correct. kind of coincidence that all these things are happening in or around the uh, the, the area of this particular pod. Yeah. The uh, and, and again, I get I the the fact that we have um, the ground half couplings or if even flight half couplings that leak is. I'm, is fairly common in, in as much as that we do see those during servicing operations and those types of things and we often repair those um, either during those operations or in between missions and stuff they have a, a propensity to uh, to have some leaks and some issues especially during the mating process you can have some issues with those but these are completely separate locations completely separate you know, separate events 
Okay. Bill? Uh, Bill Harwood, CBS. Uh, just to follow that for a second, I'm, where that access panel is, if I'm looking at the back of the pod and there's an Ohm's rocket nozzle, is the panel somewhere on that surface or is it yes. somewhere else? That's where it is. Yes, it's on 5902 door, which is on that, the main servicing panel that's on that side. And in the vertical, that would be underneath and coming up that way, and there's a rack that goes up there. Um, you mentioned traffic on Election Day. If it comes down to that's when you guys decide to do your launch. Uh, I realize this is not a question for you and it's for upper management, but since you're here, um, can you imagine that they would give any consideration to go into Wednesday since you'd still have five launch days in uh, avoid the traffic with schools letting out and people trying to vote and all of that going on at the same time you guys are trying to launch? The, uh, the ability for us to launch on Tuesday um, actually becomes a little less complex than it would have been if we were to launch it on Monday. The issue becomes an issue for us during this, if we had, were to not be able to launch and had to do a scrub turnaround. Um, the ability to send people home through the traffic and the types of things that we're expecting combined with maybe some additional uh, folks that are out for doing voting would be more of an issue for people to be able to leave the Space Center to go home, get some rest, and come back to work. That won't happen until after that event. So it wouldn't really affect our, our first day of launch on Tuesday. It would be more a concern for Wednesday. We've set up um, a process in place to make sure that we understand through the supervisory chain um, that folks are able to get home, get appropriate rest, and get back to work. And if there are issues, we've set up some hotlines and some other types of things that we can make sure that we have um, all the right folks here and the ability to do the right thing uh, with the team and we'll make that evaluation prior to going into tanking if we need to. Yeah, just for the record you guys are pressing hard to make Tuesday if you can make it and, and those issues traffic collection whatever won't be a factor in the decision to press ahead. Right now that's the plan correct. Yeah, thank you. How about Ken in the front? Yeah sorry. Hi, thank you. Ken Kramer for Space Flight Magazine and the Planetary Society. Can you talk a little bit, uh, Jeff, about the history of this type of repair? Is there any issue with it being, uh, since you found it at the, at the pad instead of in the, uh, in the uh, VAB or the OPF, any difficulty with access or change in access? Well, normally we wouldn't find this type of event um, in the VAB because we don't have these systems uh, connected in that facility. Um, occasionally you will see this type of thing in the OPF, but often it's during when we're actually doing the fluid transfers and some of the gas transfers that we would do at the pad. And that servicing operation is normally performed at the pad because they're, they're hazardous operations and they're performed at that particular location. Um, we do also hook up these type of um, connections when the pod is removed from the vehicle down when it's doing its offline processing as well. So. We do see those types of things. The repairs are generally the same in any of those locations. Um, and, and generally, it's just to remove and replace the, the, the components that they need to. And there's some soft goods in there and, and things, but they generally remove the whole poppet and, and replace it because it's easier, easier to do so. so. So has this particular repair ever been done at the pad before? Or is oh, this yes. the first time? Sure. Sure. Mm -hmm. okay. All right. Looking around for other hands. Anybody else? Hey, Marsh, you have a follow-up? Associated Press for Jeff. What, um, as far as voting by the launch team, um, had you already taken that into account previously and instructed your teams to do early voting, or how are they going to be able to vote if they want to and also support a launch? And that was um, something that we recognized, you know, a long time ago. That the possibility for the, the dates to line up um, could be a, a realistic um, event. So we did encourage the team we have throughout the entire pad flow to take advantage of early voting, absentee voting, any other types of means, because we certainly want to give everybody the opportunity to get out and and do that on on election day, uh, if they were unable to do so on election day. So we want to make sure that everybody has the ability to to vote and and to do those types of things. So I think we've done a pretty good job overall of, of making people aware that there could be potentially those things line up and it would generally just be the folks that are there on launch day itself it's the launch team even though that's a lot of folks but um, a lot of other people are not necessarily there and the early voting process I think here at least in Brevard goes all the way through including Saturday and and we like I said we've been encouraging folks right along providing information about uh, you know where they can do uh, voting and those types of things throughout the throughout the flow so approximately inclusive of in the, the prime firing room, there's probably about 125 folks in the prime firing room. There's a lot of other support functions that are out here, though, of course. Okay, and James? Uh, James, Dean, Florida Today. Jeff, could you just uh, uh, detail again exactly the timing of, of the go-forward plan? Um, 
when when should these couplings be have been replaced? When will the repress start and finish? And therefore, when I guess when we know for sure that um, you are go to uh, start, you know, called stations, pick up the countdown, all that tomorrow. The details of exactly how those are working out or in a meeting that's going on currently because this is really a late breaking item as you, you all are probably aware um, so we are working out the details of exactly how and we're sequencing sequencing the work we started with the tank vent which is already done at this point to get us into a configuration so we can begin um, doing that additional work we're prepping to do the the coupling uh, removal and replacements we also have to gain access um, and remove another door and uh, and do some additional vent downs prior to getting into the final um, final repress later, but um, it'll be this afternoon sometime. I don't have those specifics on the times because, again, that those meetings are going on as we speak for the removal and replacement of the parts yeah, okay. before we'll be able to get okay. into the remainder of the. So process. your your confidence level in in turning around for the second is is very high then. Oh, I, I, right now I think it is. You know. Uh, and again, it'll, it'll, as always, is contingent upon the work, but we're very confident in the workforce. We, we trust their ability to do this job. There's just plenty of experience out there on this. So right now we don't have any real concerns. I was just asking about the likelihood on Tuesday. I know with the, uh, I understand the elections not having any consideration as to whether or not you guys are going to go up, but the likelihood of it happening that day, I know we have a lot of people wondering, you know, it's going to be an intense day, but the likelihood of it happening on Tuesday. What do you see, which was at this point? Well, assuming we have the, we get the repair done, which you know at this point we're assuming that we are, I, I, you know, the, the, we would launch on that date as a as a launch date. I think that um, that was asked a little bit earlier, but we would use that date if in fact we can get the work done to get to that point. Bill, yeah, just one more really quick one. What is the nitrogen in this case used for? Did, did you, the issue with the nitrogen coupling. What is that system used for? Um, it's used for both for valving and also for um, haulage pressure on some of the smaller tanks that we have in there. Mm -hmm. Okay, any other questions? Um, Chow for space.com. Um, question for Jeff. You mentioned that um, when the leaks were discovered, you tried to do some overnight repairs. I'm just wondering if you could go into a little bit more detail about what you attempted to do and why they were unsuccessful overnight. Well, the standard process is to remove and, and inspect both sides to see if there's any obvious either contamination, scoring, things that may have caused the, the, the system to leak. And then if they look good, we'll go ahead and remake them and, and then try again. Sometimes they reseat themselves, these poppets do. Sometimes we can um, bump up the pressure a little bit, cause them to reseat, and we try all of those different things. And in this case, we did see some contamination there. As I mentioned, there was some seal, portion of a seal there that, that should not have been in that location. We removed that, remade it, and, and attempted to try to get the, uh, the system to, to lock up. And we, we did get it to eventually lock up, but um, we weren't really comfortable with that configuration at this point, knowing that there was possibly some contamination in that poppet. So. Mark Boucher, Space Ref. How many times has this happened uh, at the pad? I don't have the exact number, uh, how many times. Um, we can probably get I'll that at some point. That Okay, anything else? Okay, not seeing any other questions. Um, I guess it's needless to say, but I guess I'll say it. The uh, TV schedule and the briefing schedules are in flux, and we're in the process of reevaluating that right now to, to get uh, all that locked in, so I can't exactly tell you when our next briefing will be. But uh, please stay tuned to, uh, to NASA.gov and to www.nasa.gov slash shuttle. That'll have the updated uh, shuttle schedule as well as the briefing schedule, and we'll have that on later today. Thanks for joining us. Thank you.